So for this video, we're going to be focusing on some of the more ethical aspects of medicine with specific respect to the legal side. In this video, we're going to be talking about common law, mental capacity assessments, and the Mental Health Act. Basically, what to do when a patient refuses treatment. This isn't just valuable for exams, this is valuable for your entire career, particularly in the urgent care or emergency settings. Let's kick off with common law. Informally, it's considered the doctrine of necessity and its true use really comes in the emergency setting, when deliberation as to whether a patient has or hasn't got capacity, or not even a mental health disorder, can't wait. I think this is best considered via a clinical example. Let's say you see a young man, who we'll call Mr D, who has been hit by a bus on the way home from work, with quite significant life-threatening injuries. He's got clinical signs suggestive of a tension pneumothorax and is extremely unsettled, resisting all medical attention. Given the immediacy of the situation, if you don't solve his tension pneumothorax, this gentleman is likely to die. Given that he's confused and you don't have any time to ta undertake an MCA or an MHA, and thus in a life-saving situation like this, common law should be utilised to do whatever it is necessary to save this man's life, and in this case, that's an emergency chest drain. I mentioned in a previous video the use of common law, and in fact, really it can be used in the court of law as a defence if the situation arises, with most clinicians not even knowing that they use it. Common law in the medical setting relies on two key principles. The clinician must deem the action necessary to prevent harm to the patient and others, and the actions must be proportionate to the likelihood of a harm occurring. It can be used both in physical and mental health disorders. If you're liking this video so far, be sure to like and subscribe and make sure you leave a comment below for any suggestions or requests for future videos. Be sure to find us on Facebook as well, where we post regular content on there too. Let's go back to Mr D. He's got his chest drain in and he's out of immediate danger. He ends up being intubated in ITU because of his injuries and is found to have a significant blunt force trauma to the abdomen, causing large amounts of internal bleeding. This requires surgery and he's recovering well with subsequent abdominal drain in situ. Further history is established via his GP and it's established that Mr D actually has paranoid schizophrenia. A day later, he is extubated but is quite confused, agitated and trying to remove his abdominal drain. So, what do we do here? Now, first thing we need to consider when acting in a patient's best interests against their wishes is whether we're using the Mental Capacity Act or the Mental Health Act. The Mental Capacity Act of 2005 is primarily used for physical disorders that disrupt mental functions and its principles rely on the following that a patient can understand, retain, process and convey that information for a time and specific question. That's important, as some patients may have capacity for simple questions but may not have capacity if it involves complex treatment. And remember, it's only for patients over 16 years old. You must also show evidence that you've taken all necessary steps to help that patient establish capacity. And also recognise that just because you think the patient is making an unwise decision doesn't necessarily mean he doesn't have capacity. Going back to Mr D, you established this gentleman is likely to be delirious. And because of a comorbid chest infection, massive trauma, a major surgery, and deeming him not to have capacity for specifically the treatment he is receiving, i.e. rehab from trauma, surgery, antibiotics, etc. You establish that Mr D does not have capacity, and this is subsequently documented and is deemed in the patient's best interest. Just to clarify, as you have established a physical cause that has caused a disruption in mental function, the Mental Capacity Act is used and not the Mental Health Act. Additionally, if the patient doesn't have an exokin or a formal representative and the Mental Capacity Act is being used for major medical treatment or intervention, then you would have to instruct an independent mental capacity advocate or an IMCA to take upon this role if it's not an emergency situation. So, we head back to Mr D, whose delirium is slowly resolving. A few days later, he is seen to have third-person auditory hallucinations where he feels that aliens are present to abduct him. He keeps trying to pull out his cannulae, an abdominal drain despite your advice. You sensibly seek the advice of the mental health liaison team who say they won't be able to see him for another 12 hours, but advise you to detain him under the section 5-2 if you feel it's appropriate. He is seen by the on-call psychiatrist later that evening who places him under section 2 of the Mental Health Act and initiates antipsychotics. You also simultaneously assess his capacity in regards to the decision of having ongoing rehab care and deem him not to have mental capacity for this decision. This man is having a relapse of his schizophrenia in the context of improving delirium. Thus, it is entirely appropriate to detain him under the Mental Health Act, Section 5.2, which we'll come back to in a minute. This will allow him to have treatment for his mental health disorder, and thus ongoing mental health treatment would require the Mental Capacity Act to be used, were he to continue to refuse treatment. 
A Section 52 is essentially a doctor's holding power and lasts for 72 hours and can be completed by any clinician caring for the patient. It basically requires all other restrictive measures to have been taken and to only occur in an inpatient setting. It requires a full address, the delegation of the person completing the form and the reason why it's used, with the notes filed in the patient's notes and the Mental Health Act office informed. It basically buys you time for a formal Mental Health Act assessment to be done by a Section 12 qualified clinician, which will allow you to have a Section 2 or 3, if needed, to subsequently be completed and thus treatment of the mental health disorder initiated. There are a number of sections that you need to be familiar with, but as I mentioned earlier, Section 5.2 is probably the most important for most doctors. Some of the other important sections include Section 2, which lasts for 28 days, which allows compulsory admission for assessment and or treatment. Section 3, which lasts for 6 months and allows a treatment. Section 4, which is the emergency department's holding power for 72 hours for assessment. Section 5.2, which is an inpatient doctor's holding power for 72 hours, as discussed earlier. Section 5.4, which is the holding power for nurses in in inpatient setting for 6 hours. Section 1.3.5, where the police can force entry into one's home. And Section 136, where a police officer can detain up to 24 hours and bring the patient to a place of safety. You might commonly see this in A&E as Section 136 suites. I talk about these more in a previous video called the Admin Crash Course, which I'll leave a link to below. There are, however, a number of grey areas when it comes to the Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act, most notably when both a physical health condition and mental health condition are at play. And it's often not very simple to differentiate delirium, for example, to psychosis. Additionally, there are a few caveats where the Mental Health Act can be used for physical health reasons, but they often are a consequence of the mental health deterioration. For example, an NG feed for people with anorexia. As mentioned before, these frameworks can get confusing and in any doubt, especially psychiatry advice should be sought. So, to summarise what can be a very confusing topic, common law is used for emergencies where time is of the essence, Mental capacity is used to restrain and treat a patient in their best interests in the context of a physical illness disrupting capacity. Whereas the Mental Health Act is only for patients with mental health disorders to protect the patient and or others. And make sure you speak to specialist psychiatry team when needed. Well, that's that. I know understanding legal frameworks can be a minefield, but I truly hope that this video helps clarify a few things, particularly to help your clinical practice as well as revision for exams. If you've enjoyed this, be sure to like and subscribe. Leave a little comment below for any questions or requests. We've also got a Facebook and Twitter page too, so make sure you're following there as well. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.